Number 8. Chris and Christine A young woman and her boyfriend went on a murder spree in Houston, Texas during the summer of 2003. Their targets featured some of the girl's supposed close friends. 17-year-old Christine Paolilla and her older boyfriend Chris Snyder killed four young adults on July 18th. While growing up, Christine had a very rough childhood. At an early age, her drug addict father died, and not long after she was diagnosed with a condition that makes it difficult to grow any body hair, alopecia. Along with this, in school she was constantly teased by kids who would pull off her wigs and make fun of the way she looked. However, things changed in high school. For some reason Christine didn't fully understand, two of the most popular girls at her high school befriended her. Before long, she had a makeover and was also among the it crowd, but there was still a darker side to her life she was hiding from her new friends, Rachel Colarudis and Tiffany Rao. Christine started dating Chris around this time, and their relationship was far from perfect. The two seemed obsessed with each other in a toxic, unhealthy way and would constantly fight. Chris admitted that he was terrified of his lover since she would often hit him if she got jealous for any reason. The night of the murders, Christine's friends and some others were targeted. The victims' bodies were severely disturbed. Over 40 bullets were shot that night, and police described the scene as overkill. Let's just say the crime scene would scare even the toughest of cops for a lifetime. For years, no one suspected the true killers. After all, why would anyone think a 17-year-old girl was capable of such horror? As time went on, Chris and Christine eventually separated, with Chris ending up in jail over an unrelated charge and Christine getting married to a man named Justin Rott. On the anniversary of the killings, a news story was put out about the murders. In either a swing of guilt or pride, Christine admitted her past crimes to Justin. When her and Chris's actions broke news headlines, there was a rightful uproar. Christine was given a life sentence, while her former lover opted to end his own life instead of serving his time behind bars. Number 7. Taken Too Young In 2017, 54-year-old Aubrey Trail and his younger girlfriend Bailey Boswell brutally murdered 24-year-old Sidney Louf in Nebraska. The couple claimed that the young hardware store clerk came to Trail's apartment believing she'd be part of a consensual group sex session with two other women. However, that's not how the situation played out. In reality, Sydney had gone out for a date with someone she met online, but she wouldn't make it back alive. In court, Trail claimed his girlfriend brought Sydney to his home to recruit her. Apparently, the couple had been up to some strange business which included cult activities. Trail confessed that he didn't think they could let Loof go without her telling others about what had happened. Without going into too many details about what the woman may have witnessed, Trail simply said, I have done some terrible things in my life. On December 4th of that year, a little less than a month after Sydney was reported missing, her dismembered remains were discovered. They were found inside old garbage bags that had been left in a random Nebraskan field. After confessing to his actions, Trail claimed his girlfriend Bailey had nothing to do with the actual murder. Actually, he screamed this out as he tried to cut his own throat in the courtroom. For his part in the murder of Sidney Louf, Trail received a death sentence, while his lover, despite his claims of her innocence, was sentenced to life in prison. Number 6. Sister Envy In many cases, siblings become your earliest friends that stay with you for a lifetime but not everyone has a good relationship with their brothers and sisters. On September 26, 2022, 21-year-old Fatia Marzan from Florida and her younger sister Saima Marzan got into an argument that would change their family forever. Early that morning, the girls started fighting in their room. Apparently, 20-year-old Saima had been talking to Fatia's boyfriend without her sister knowing. The two had been messaging through the popular video game known as Valorant. When this news reached Fatia, she immediately became hysterically furious. She found one message her man sent Saima, saying he was in love with her. This news would have been a huge shock to anyone, but it wasn't the first time Fatia's boyfriend had been a little too close with her sister. For about a year, she said Saima's been trying to steal her boyfriend. 
Fatia had expressed her feelings many time about this strange relationship to both Saima and her man, but nothing seemed to improve. The boyfriend kept flirting back. After confronting her sister yet again and not getting anywhere productive this time, Fatia pulled out a knife she had kept hidden in the closet. A few weeks before, she bought a dagger-style knife set online without telling anyone. With the weapon in hand, she attacked Saima, stabbing her straight in the heart multiple times. Later that night, Fatia called the authorities and owned up to what she did. At the moment, she is being held in custody at an Orange County jail cell awaiting trial dates. Number 5. Addict The bodies of two individuals, Maddie Durden Hollenby and Benjamin Green, were found together on August 27, 2021 in Kettering, Ohio. One of them had been stabbed and killed, while the other had a self-inflicted wound to their neck. It was a classic but gruesome case of a murder-suicide. Benjamin was a complicated 41-year-old man who was known by many to be extremely misogynistic and a borderline sex addict. This personality conflicted with the fact that he was also married with three children. Someone who formerly knew him said he straight up treated all women like they were his personal property. He was basically a walking red flag. Contrary to Benjamin, Maddie was beloved by everyone who knew her. Both family and friends of the young 22-year-old say she was just as beautiful on the inside as she was on the outside. The marketing executive was talented and creative and was just starting out in her career with so much potential. It's believed that the two had been seeing each other romantically for about a year before this incident. Police went to the site where the bodies were found after someone called and asked for a wellness check on Maddie. Benjamin's motive for killing his young lover before turning the knife on himself is unknown. But this is an extremely tragic case for the loved ones of both parties involved. What's the worst thing you've ever done to gain the attention of someone you were interested in? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're at it, hit that subscribe button. Number 4. COVID Cover-Up In April 2020, during the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic in Florida, 43-year-old David Anthony killed his 51-year-old estranged wife Gretchen. She had been missing for a few weeks and no one had actually seen her in person. What's weird is that her loved ones were still getting text messages from Gretchen's phone saying nothing was wrong. She was just in the hospital getting treated after catching COVID. This didn't sit well with many who knew her though and soon enough, David was arrested. Around the time of Gretchen's disappearance, her neighbor remembered hearing strange screaming coming from the woman's home. When police investigated, they realized that security cameras had been taken down from many of the walls. However, investigators called the company behind the devices and were able to get footage of that morning. They saw a strange man waiting outside the home on Gretchen's patio. After a struggle, authorities were able to get David to admit where he hid his wife's body. He had taken her remains a few miles from the house he killed her in and left her in some grass behind a Walmart. This discovery was months after the initial crime but the victim's family could finally get some sense of comfort knowing their loved one's body was back in good hands. As for David's sentence, he'll be rotting away in prison for quite some time. He's not scheduled to be released until 2058, but hopefully, that'll be the rest of his life. Number 3. GoFundMe A couple from New Jersey were caught in a GoFundMe scheme when they claimed to raise money for a homeless man, only to keep it for themselves. In the past few years, videos online featuring selfless acts of philanthropy have gone viral. Whether it's the insane acts done by popular YouTuber Mr. Beast, where he throws millions of dollars into helping others, or the simpler content of someone being a good Samaritan and paying for another's groceries, you've likely seen it done. Many praise these acts of service, while others think it's strange and selfish to put those in need on film for views and admiration. In 2018, one couple was put on blast after allegedly trying to help a homeless man get some extra cash. Mark D'Amico and Caitlin McClure from New Jersey were accused of stealing over $400,000 out of GoFundMe donations. Johnny Bobbitt was homeless when he gave his last bit of cash to Caitlin when her vehicle ran out of gas while she was driving on the highway. After news of this selfless act got out, the story went viral online and across many platforms 
With all this attention, Caitlin and Mark decided to set up a donation page to pay Johnny back for what he did. The GoFundMe drew in hundreds of thousands of dollars with donors from all over the world. This would have been great news if only the couple didn't steal out of the account and use the money to buy themselves luxury vacations, an expensive brand new BMW, and much more. When Johnny found out about this, he was rightfully upset. He filed a lawsuit against the pair, but they clapped back saying the formerly homeless man just used the cash to fuel his drug addiction. Later in court though, it was revealed that all three of the individuals involved in this case likely fabricated the whole situation in order to draw money out of the kindness of others. For this sick act of indecency, Mark was given five years in prison, Caitlin will have to serve one year, and Johnny has to enroll in a state drug court program while waiting for a further sentence. It just goes to show that some people will take advantage of any situation and that you shouldn't always believe what you read online. Number 2. Twilight A young girl and her boyfriend went on a killing spree after getting into a fight with her mother in April of 2016 in Spalding, Lincolnshire. The Twilight book and movie franchise has gathered avid fans from across the globe. This story about vampires conjures up a romantic fantasy in the minds of many young girls who consume it. Some might even call it their favorite movie. But when would you say is a good time to watch it? On Halloween? Valentine's Day? Or maybe after committing a murder? This story involves the latter. On April 14, 2016, 14-year-olds Kim Edwards and Lucas Markham were in a whirlwind of a relationship, the epitome of intense young love. After an argument with her mother, Kim turned to her boyfriend and asked for help killing her and her younger sister. The boy happily agreed. Lucas went upstairs in the Edwards household and brutally killed his girlfriend's family. Then he casually came downstairs to grab something to eat before he and Kim cuddled up on the couch to watch Twilight. Apparently, they also had intercourse in the wake of the crime. Kim had an older sister named Mary who lived somewhere else at the time of the murders. Mary says that she always had suspicions that her sister's new boyfriend was a bad influence. She even said they were a ticking time bomb together. Apparently, the young couple had tried to commit the murders three times before being successful, which shows that this wasn't just a spur-of-the-moment decision. The teenagers had been thinking about killing the family for a while. When Kim and Lucas were arrested, the English court gave them each life sentences for what they'd done. Psych evaluations were conducted because it was difficult for authorities to believe two regular teenagers could do something so horrible. Unfortunately, no mental discrepancies were uncovered besides a possible personality disorder in Kim. Number 1. Brittany Wilson Buckle up because this might be one of the wildest Christmas stories you've ever heard. On Christmas Eve 2021, 32-year-old Brittany Wilson and her fiancé, 34-year-old Harrison Foster, were enjoying their night together, getting festive at their Cape Girardeau, Missouri home. These festivities included taking some meth to really get into the holiday spirit, but the drugs started to mess with Brittany's mind. At some point during her meth trip, the mother of two took a sword and stabbed her unsuspecting lover. According to what she told the police, she thought there were other beings living inside Harrison's body and that she had to get them out. The woman also claimed to have harvested pieces of other people's bodies as well. These crazy ramblings were all admitted after Brittany called the authorities on herself and told them what she did. When 911 showed up, they found her in front of her home in Missouri covered in blood with the sword lying nearby. Before killing Harrison, Brittany posted a meme to her Facebook account about having multidimensional experiences. To top everything off, the insane woman, likely still influenced by meth, had a bright, shining smile in her arrest photo. Her sentencing is unclear, but she was charged with first-degree murder for killing her fiancé. One of the saddest parts about this story is that two young children lost both a mother and a father figure just one day before Christmas.
Number 10, Aaron Guerrero and Sierra Halseth. In April 2021, a 16-year-old girl, Sierra Halseth, and her 18-year-old boyfriend, Aaron Guerrero, were arrested for killing her father in Las Vegas. Authorities believe they had murdered 45-year-old Daniel Halseth, whose burned body was found in the garage. All evidence pointed toward the victim being killed before the fire, which was also believed to be intentionally set. The pair even tried to dismember the body with some power tools they purchased using the victim's credit cards. Police found a large burn area in the living room with blood nearby, as well as a chainsaw and handsaw with blood and tissue splattered across them. The coroner examined the dead body and ruled that Daniel died from sharp force injuries. It didn't take long for cops to track the teens down using surveillance footage that showed them leaping in the father's vehicle. Investigators later found out that while the two were dating, they were forbidden from seeing each other because they planned to steal money from their parents and run off together into the sunset. The couple didn't accept this fate, so they decided to murder Daniel in cold blood. Perhaps the most disturbing evidence surfaced a couple of months later when a cell phone video showed the two laughing about murdering somebody and having lots of sex near the crime scene. They recorded this while still on the run from police. In May 2022, the teens pleaded guilty to nine counts, including murder, arson, and robbery. While the two have not been sentenced, they could spend the rest of their lives in prison and deservedly so. Number 9 Evelyn Gainza and Damar Terraweas In September 18, an 18-year-old Miami woman named Evelyn Gainza allegedly murdered her own father Evelio over a dispute revolving money. She then tried to stage a home invasion with her 19-year-old boyfriend, Damar Teruelis, and use another man as a cover-up. At first, they believed Damar was the one who pulled the trigger, but later they debunked this theory when Damar himself turned on his girlfriend and agreed to testify against her for a better sentence. He pleaded guilty to being an accessory to murder after the fact and will spend five years behind bars with 10 years probation once he gets out. According to Damar, Evelyn's father spoiled her, but she wasn't grateful at all. She didn't care about studying often smoked pot and was usually found hanging out with the wrong crowd. At one point, she even hit her father with a baseball bat while he was sleeping on the couch. Instead of turning his daughter in, Avelio sent her daughter for a psychiatric evaluation and just wanted her to do better. After getting released from the hospital, she spent a few months with Damar in Lehigh Acres but eventually came back to Miami. She believed that her father had been collecting government assistance payments because she was a minor and that she should have gotten the money instead. When Avelio refused to hand his daughter the cash, she got out a gun and shot shot him in the back multiple times until he was dead. Number 8. Benjamin O'Shea and Naomi Johnson In January 2022, 26-year-old Benjamin and 24-year-old Naomi from Southwark were sent to prison for the murder of their own child, Amina Faye Johnson. The couple called authorities when their 8-week-old baby stopped breathing and doctors initially thought it was SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, but x-rays showed a different story and a large amount of injuries inflicted on the child. An expert in osteoarticular pathology revealed the fractures couldn't have been accidental and confirmed that the baby had suffered limb and rib fractures on at least nine separate occasions. Radiologists found several other fractures on Amina's body that indicated she had suffered continued physical abuse during her short life at the hands of her parents. Her injuries also showed that she had suffered bleeding in her head. The couple was found guilty in November 2021 of, quote, causing or allowing a child to suffer serious physical harm. Benjamin was sentenced to eight and a half years in prison while Naomi got seven. After getting arrested, the pair tried to blame their daughter's death on a visit to the doctor and claimed that paramedics were responsible for the child's injuries. The judge, who was present at their sentencing in the inner London Crown Court, stated that this case had the highest seriousness in terms of cruelty towards a child that they'd ever dealt with. It wasn't revealed which one of them actually was to blame for the fatal injuries and who just stood there and let it all happen. Later, the couple was also found guilty of cruelty to another child, and the Metropolitan Police described their many crimes as simply monstrous. Number 7. Elizabeth Uchman and Brandon Copeland A young couple in San Diego, California was arrested and accused of killing their three-month-old baby Delilah. This happened only a few weeks after she was sent home to her parents by social services. 22-year-old Elizabeth Uchman and 21-year-old Brandon Copeland faced charges for one count of first-degree murder back in November 2021. According to local TV news stations, the police responded to a call about an unresponsive infant in northeastern San Diego and found Delilah not breathing. Authorities performed CPR and even emergency medical services arrived to take the child to the hospital, but nothing worked. 
Delilah was later pronounced dead. Elizabeth's grandmother, Adrienne Arnett, told NBC San Diego that she believed Delilah was abused before her death. She claimed that Benjamin especially had been a threat to the baby. She revealed that social services took the child away from her parents because they deemed the couple's apartment unsuitable for the baby to live in. But after they cleaned up the home, Delilah was returned to her parents despite their relatives' warnings to the authorities. Social services were repeatedly told her parents were dangerous. One of their neighbors, Sabrina Camacho, revealed that she didn't even realize the couple had a kid because she never heard them scream or cry, but she did hear two adults arguing often. Elizabeth is being held without bond at Las Colinas Detention and Reentry Facility, while Brandon is being held at San Diego Central Jail. If found guilty, they each could face up to 25 years in prison. Do you think 25 years is enough time? Tell us in the comments and hit subscribe while you're at it. Number 6. Jolie Callen and Lauren Daniel Bunner 18-year-old Jolie Callen had her whole life ahead of her. She was an ambitious young girl with big dreams and massive potential. She was pretty popular in high school and was known for dyeing her hair in punky pink and purple colors. She had a new boyfriend and was just about to start college when her ex, Lauren Daniel Bunner, invited her to go on one last hiking trip. She agreed, not knowing it would be the last thing she'd ever do. On this trip, the two were supposed to reconcile and come to terms with being friends after their breakup. Apparently, their relationship had been pretty rocky and Bunner was extremely possessive. He only wanted her to spend time with him and his friends and would get jealous if she hung out with anyone else. She tried to break up with him multiple times but stopped every single time once he started threatening to kill himself if she left. Eventually, she succeeded in breaking things off. So this hike was more than just a fun trip for Bunner. He was furious for the way things had gone down. On August 30th, 2015, they took Callan's dog to the Pinhoti Trail in the Alabama countryside and started enjoying nature scenery. Chillingly enough, Bunner posted pictures of the day's events to his Instagram page. He uploaded three photos of his ex-girlfriend, with the last photo being taken just a few moments before her death. Using a 22 caliber bear claw, Bunner fired a bullet into the back of Jolie's head. But he didn't stop there. When she fell to the ground, he turned her over and shot her between the eyes before shoving her off a 40-foot or 12.2-meter cliff. A couple years later, he pleaded guilty to the murder and was sentenced to 52 years in prison for taking Jolie's life in such a vicious way. Number 5. Aaron Caffrey and Charlie Wilkinson 16-year-old Aaron Caffrey met 18-year-old Charlie Wilkinson while working as a waitress at a Sonic fast food restaurant. They immediately hit it off, and their relationship progressed super quickly. He even gave her a promise ring and was very vocal about wanting to marry her in the future. But their parents didn't approve of the relationship at all. Aaron's father, Terry Caffey, noted that he had reservations about Wilkinson from the very beginning and there were just some things about the boy that didn't sit right with him. Aaron started messing up in school and stopped going to church, something she had previously enjoyed. Her parents were understandably concerned and decided to find out more about their daughter's new boyfriend. They saw his MySpace page and found out that there were a bunch of sexual references and other disturbing posts. The Caffeys insisted that their daughter end a relationship, and Aaron was not happy about it at all. Her friends would later tell authorities that she would often talk about killing her parents in front of them since she believed it was the only way she could be with Wilkinson. And soon, Aaron planned a massacre of her own with Wilkinson and his friend Charles Wade. And on March 30th, 2018, the two boys pulled into the Caffey's driveway. Aaron and Wade's girlfriend waited outside in the car. Wilkinson then went inside and shot her parents and Aaron's two siblings, Tyler and Matthew. After that, they set the whole house on fire by pouring lighter fluid on the furniture. Somehow, the father managed to come back to consciousness and crawled out through a window. He told police about Wilkinson, and soon the authorities caught the culprits. Wilkinson, Wade, and Aaron were all given life sentences. Number 4. Ellen Rose Fryer and Gavin McFarlane Aaron Rose Fryer was only 15 when she got into her relationship with 19-year-old Gavin Curtis McFarlane. Unsurprisingly, her father Aaron was not happy about this at all since he thought the age difference was inappropriate. Ellen didn't take kindly to this reaction, so she planned the murder of her father with her boyfriend and 22-year-old Russell Pierce Jones II. And they killed her father in the most gruesome way imaginable. One morning in October 2017, poor Aaron was beaten to death in his own home in Oregon. Then, the trio loaded his body into a car and dumped it. It didn't take long for police to figure out what happened. And soon, they arrested Gavin and Ellen. 
In January 2019, she pled guilty to conspiring to murder her father and a few months later was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Because Gavin was an adult, he was found guilty of homicide and was given a life sentence. Ellen told the court that while she can't erase the past, she's since found religion and forgiveness and can now see humanity from a new compassionate perspective. Until she's 25, she'll spend her time in a juvenile facility before getting transferred to a women's correctional institute to carry out the remainder of her sentence. Number 3. Joshua Mabain and Linda Berry Joshua and Linda had been dating for less than a week when the two 17-year-olds got a taxi in Northeast Washington, D.C. with the intention of robbing their driver, Mohammed Quadir. Joshua made Quadir drive them to a local school in the area, and after they arrived, he shot the driver in the back of the head. After this, the car started accelerating and then crashed into a tree. Police would later find the vehicle burning with Mohammed's dead body still inside. The couple was also extremely careless after carrying out the murder. Linda allegedly told someone that they'd robbed a cab driver, and this person gave the tip to cops after looking up the story online about the incident. She also told someone else that she had killed a cab driver with her boyfriend and even showed them a bruise she received from the accident. The suspect's homes were then searched, and authorities found a bunch of evidence from Joshua. He was hiding a black handgun, ammunition, and even hotel receipts from the area near the murder. There was also a note in Linda's home that said they shouldn't have taken the dude's money. Money. The pair were found guilty and were sentenced to 45 years in prison. Co-workers described Muhammad as a nice person who was very serious about his work. He never got into any trouble and kept his nose clean. All it took was two snot-nosed kids to end a decent man's life. Number 2 Justine Winner and Brian Langford On August 16, 2011 in Montana, 16-year-old Justine Winner got into a terrible argument with her boyfriend Brian Langford. She felt so horrible that she wanted to take her own life and decided to use her car as the weapon of choice. Justine just wanted the pain to end. She was driving at over 80 miles per hour, or just about 130 kilometers per hour, and crashed headfirst into another car. That vehicle belonged to a 34-year-old pregnant woman named Erin who had her 13-year-old son with her. They all died after impact. Justine herself survived but sustained brain damage and other injuries and was forced to go through a bunch of surgeries. Initially, she tried to convince everyone the accident was Erin's fault, but soon authorities found out her story had too many loopholes. They discovered that she was texting her boyfriend only minutes before the crash and even told him she was going to try and kill herself by wrecking the car. A couple years later, she was charged as an adult and convicted of deliberate homicide. At first, she was sentenced to over 30 years in prison, but later the judge reduced her sentence by half. Then in 2015, Justine was placed under parole due to good behavior, and she's now walking as a free woman. Number 1. Frank DeLeon Jr. and Diamond Alvarez In January 2022, a 15-year-old girl named Diamond was meeting her boyfriend Frank to confront him for cheating on her. According to the Houston Police Department, Frank did not take this well at all and shot her 22 times in the back. Diamond's family heard the gunshots and quickly ran out to try and help her. They were alarmed after seeing her dog Peanut alone and knew something was wrong. When they found her body, her mother attempted CPR to bring her back to life, but at that point, it was too late. Paramedics declared Diamond dead at the scene, and just like that, a wonderful young girl's life was over in an instant. As for the culprit, he tried to flee from justice, and when the cops found him, he literally had suitcases and clothes on his bed. He was charged with murder, but soon walked free after his family posted $250,000 bond. Understandably, the victim's loved ones were furious over this and wanted Frank to be in custody. They even carried out protests and argued the culprit was a flight risk since he had been previously caught trying to escape. A few months later, he was arrested again for violating his curfew's rules and is currently back in prison serving time. If convicted, he's expected to get a life sentence for the murder. Number 7. Chris Watts on August 13, 2018, 34-year-old Shanann Watts went missing along with her two children in Frederick, Colorado. Her disappearance was reported by her friend Nicole Atkinson, who noted that Shanann, who was pregnant at the time, didn't attend her regular doctor's appointment. Her husband, Chris Watts, was at work during the time she disappeared. The police arrived for a wellness check and Chris let them search for whatever they wanted. He seemed pretty annoyed by the whole situation instead of being worried his family had vanished. He would later go on to say he was having marital problems and that she may have just gone off to get some space. He gave his own version of what happened between the two, although his story changed multiple times over the coming days. The FBI and their Colorado affiliate formally started investigating the matter. While looking, they found out Watts had been ignoring Shanann for a while in their relationship. The two were rarely ever intimate, and they also found out he was having an affair, which is a big red flag. 
Chris quickly became a suspect in the case, and eventually, on August 15th, around two days after the disappearance, he failed a polygraph test and was arrested shortly after. By now, he wasn't just a suspect in the case, but the prime one. All the prosecution needed was a confession, and they got exactly that when Chris told them he'd tell the truth if his father heard it first. Eventually, on August 21st, 2018, the police arranged a meeting between Chris and his father. They told the dad to press Chris into confessing, and it was a success. Chris revealed with apathy that he murdered Shanann and his two children and dismembered them, burying them in the Andarco Petroleum site in an oil tanker. Shortly after, Chris was charged with murder, and the bodies of his victims were discovered exactly where he said they were. On November 6, 2018, Chris Watts was given five life sentences for one count of murder, two counts of murdering a child, one count of unlawful termination of a pregnancy, and three counts of tampering with a deceased human body. How a father and husband could murder his whole family with little guilt, we'll never understand. Number 6. Babis Agnostopoulos in May of 2021, a British woman named Caroline Crouch was found dead in a home in Glicka, near Greece. Caroline was married to Babis Agnostopoulos, a Greek man who was 13 years older than her. Babis reported around three armed burglars had broken into their house that day and during the incident, Caroline was tragically killed. He said the men killed their dog first and then they tied him to a chair. He added that they forced him and his 11-month-old child to watch Carolyn get strangled to death before they robbed the house. Babis told the police he was able to reach them by dialing the emergency number with his nose. But once the police carried out an investigation of the murder, they found phone activity on Babis's phone during the time he was supposed to be tied up. The timeline also seemed off, since Carolyn was moving around and had low stress levels, according to her smartwatch, when she should have been dead. After figuring this out, police called Babis over to Athens for further questioning, and as soon as he arrived, they placed him under arrest as the prime suspect. They interrogated him for eight grueling hours, and while the exact details of what happened during the interrogation are unknown, they managed to get a confession. By June 22nd, Babis had spent over a month behind bars and was set to give his testimony in court. He was escorted by armed guards and wore a bulletproof vest when arriving at the courthouse, all while avoiding protesters outside the courthouse as well. He confessed to all of the crimes, including strangling and murdering his wife. He revealed that he had gotten into a heated argument with Carolyn, which led to the killing. The robbery story was completely made up, and he claimed the murder wasn't premeditated. He had only killed her in, quote, the heat of the moment, although that still doesn't explain why he hanged their eight-month-old dog. With all the evidence and a confession, Babis has been charged with murder, animal abuse, and child endangerment, among other minor charges. If he's convicted of all of these, as he's expected to be, he will be sentenced to life imprisonment. Hopefully, a life behind bars will be enough to keep such a sick man at bay. Do you think Babis got what he deserved? Let us know your thoughts in the comments down below. And if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. Number 5. Michael Peterson On December 9, 2001, a 58-year-old man from North Carolina named Michael Peterson called 911 and told them that his wife, 48-year-old Kathleen Peterson, fell down the stairs. He said she had been drunk before the fall, and by the time emergency services arrived, she was already dead. While the incident was initially treated as an accidental death, the police were suspicious of Michael from the very beginning. Autopsy results showed that Kathleen suffered a number of injuries from the fall, but in order to die, she would have had to lie there unattended for over two hours. Considering the incident happened in their home, it would have been nearly impossible for Michael not to have noticed and saved her life before she died. On top of that, investigators hired a medical examiner named Deborah Radish, who further examined Kathleen's body. Numerous lacerations were found on Kathleen's scalp caused by repeated blows from some kind of weapon, not by a fall, and she believed it to be the true cause of Kathleen's death. On December 20th, Michael was indicted by the Durham County Grand Jury for first-degree murder charges. He had already hired a defense attorney long before being indicted, and he surrendered to the Durham police not long after. Throughout the trial, Michael maintained his innocence. It was up to the prosecution to prove the death wasn't accidental, and that Michael had been behind the whole incident. 
On April 14, 2003, Kathleen's body was exhumed from her grave, and further investigation showed she died from blunt force trauma to the head. Around the same time, the prosecution discovered Michael had an ex-girlfriend during the 1980s in Graufhaus in Germany named Elizabeth Ratliff. She had also died in the same exact way, with Michael finding her body at the bottom of a staircase. At that point, the prosecution felt they had everything they needed, and on October 10, 2003, the verdict was announced. Michael was sentenced to life in prison for the first-degree murder of his wife, Kathleen Peterson. Number 4. Jamila Mbarak On November 3, 2004, Anthony Ashley Cooper, a British royal and the 10th Earl of Shaftesbury, disappeared without a trace in France. He arrived in the city of Nice to have a meeting with his estranged wife Jamila Mbarak, but as he was about to leave, he vanished. Soon after, he was reported missing by his girlfriend, Orche, around 12 days later in London. And on November 22nd, an official inquiry was opened in Nice. Initially, fingers were pointed at Russian or African mobsters who might have tried to steal the Earl's wealth, and many suspected he could have been kidnapped. But after a month, the case was treated as a murder since no trace of the Earl had been found. The one person who was barely even questioned during the ordeal was Jamila Mbarak, the estranged wife. Around February 2005, Jamila suffered a mental breakdown and had to be admitted to a mental institute. It was there that Jamila confessed to her involvement in her husband's murder. When the police were called, she told them her brother had gotten into a fight with the Earl and that he ended up killing him during the argument. She was arrested shortly after on February 25th, and her brother was arrested one day later in Germany. She told police that her brother had dumped Anthony's body into the trunk of a BMW and buried it at an unknown location. The body was eventually discovered in 2005. During the trial, the prosecution discovered that a week before the incident, Jamila transferred over 150,000 pounds, or just over 203,000 US dollars, into her brother's bank account. They tried to argue this was some sort of payment for a, quote, hit on the Earl of Shaftesbury. Eventually, the prosecution got their hands on a secretly recorded phone conversation between Jamila and her sister Naima. The call showed Jamila discussing the money she would pay her brother and how she put all the blame on him. On May 25, 2007, Jamila and her brother were sentenced to 25 years in prison each. Who knows what other dark secrets the royals have? Number 3. Amy Archer Gilligan Amy Archer Gilligan owned one of America's first nursing homes, and she also happened to be a serial killer. From 1907 to 1917, she owned the Archer Home for the Elderly and Infirm, where she lived with many tenants. She started the home with her first husband, James Archer. James died of natural causes in 1910, but just a few weeks before he died, Amy took out an insurance policy on him, which doesn't sound suspicious at all. She later married Michael in 1913, who died three months later due to severe indigestion, but not before he left everything he owned to Amy in his will. Amy was now extremely wealthy and the sole owner of the nursing home. Between 1911 and 1916, 48 residents at Archer Home died. Even some of the healthy patients, including Franklin R. Andrews, who seemed fine a day before his death, but somehow came down with a case of gastric ulcers. After Andrews' death, his relatives decided to do some digging. Apparently, Andrews loaned some money to Amy shortly before his death. This also happened with many other residents who died not long after loaning Amy money. It was now becoming clear Amy was killing her residents, and her weapon of choice? Arsenic. She was caught practically red-handed during a police investigation while sending residents to buy arsenic for her. In preparation for the trial, five bodies of her alleged victims were exhumed, and all of them had died of similar circumstances. Amy was eventually sentenced to death for murder, but her execution was later overturned, and she was sent to the Connecticut Hospital for the Insane instead, where she lived until her own death in 1962. Number 2. Evelyn Dick Evelyn Dick was a Canadian woman from Hamilton, Ontario, who didn't have the best relationship with her husband, John Dick. In March of 1956, John went missing until a group of five children came across a dismembered human torso just sitting in the middle of a field. It was later revealed to be John's. Evelyn was arrested for the disappearance, but when the trial happened, she was acquitted and let go. Just as she was about to walk free, though without a care in the world, another body was found in her home. Only this time, it was her son's. The body was found inside of a suitcase in the attic, 
and she was once again arrested and, this time, thankfully, convicted for the murder of her son. She was sentenced to life in prison but only served 11 years before her parole in 1958. In 1985, now 65 years old, Evelyn was officially pardoned and given a brand new identity. What happened to her since then remains unknown, and she still might be alive today, living among us all as a free woman with a dark secret. It's strange to think that someone who brutally took the lives of two people so close to her could get off with such a tame punishment. Number 1. Matt Baker On April 8, 2006, Matt Baker, a minister at Crossroads Baptist Church in Waco, Texas, called 911 after he discovered covered the body of his wife Carrie when he got home from work. When paramedics arrived, they were unable to revive her. The death was initially ruled as a suicide by overdose. Carrie became depressed after the death of their daughter seven years before, and considering Carrie's death took place around the anniversary of her daughter's death, it made sense that Carrie chose to end her life right there and then. But something still seemed off. Carrie's parents weren't willing to accept that their daughter ended her life. Carrie's mother, Linda, accused the husband, Matt, of hitting on young women behind Carrie's back. On top of this, Linda had added Matt and Carrie's cell phone number to her phone plan, and it was revealed after Carrie's death that Matt kept making calls to her phone for weeks. An investigation showed Matt had given Carrie's cell phone to a woman named Vanessa, who went to the same church. The investigation into Carrie's death was reopened with this new discovery, although when her body was exhumed, the cause of death still remained unclear. Prosecutors now believe Baker drugged his wife instead of her committing suicide. He could have done this to hide his relationship with Vanessa. During the trial, the prosecution ended up calling Vanessa to testify. Before the trial, Vanessa denied even knowing Baker personally, but during questioning, she confessed to everything. She stated that they started their affair in 2005, and around 2006, Baker planned to divorce his wife Carrie. She then revealed Matt had planned to drug his wife by giving her a powerful Ambien dose, saying it would enhance her sexual performance. She said that Baker revealed he waited for Carrie to sleep before suffocating her with a pillow. In January of 2010, Matt was found guilty of murdering his wife Carrie Baker and was sentenced to 65 years in prison. Not exactly the typical behavior for a minister. Thanks for watching. Which of these stories shocked you the most? Do you know any others? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe for more videos like these. See you next time on The Bad Badger.